let me know. Go ahead. Good morning, Judge Mahan. Good morning, Mr. Ellis. I, I am Frank Ellis. Uh, we're here today to take the oral history of Judge Mahan, Senior Judge Mahan. I'm going to call him Jim during this interview because uh, Jim and I have known each other for 42 years. Correct. And part of which I'm sure we'll get into during our discussion today. Um, I noticed, Jim, that the chair you're sitting in is one of the chairs that you and I bought when we built our building down on 9th Street. That's correct. Yeah, so it's, we've, we bought those chairs. I'm sitting in one too in 1985. So I'm, I, I'm pleased you asked me to do this and, and, uh, and let's just go and have some fun. There we go. Okay. So, um, Jim, tell us where you were where you were b born and raised. All right. I was I was born in El Paso, Texas. My father was a doctor. It was the middle of World War II, and he was stationed uh, there in El Paso uh, at Fort Bliss. And uh, anyway, that's where I was born. And then, of course, after the after the war was over, we we moved on to. Uh, uh, Chicago and Denver, but then to Grand Junction, Colorado, which is where I grew up. You you spent your 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 schooling, your lower your high school and and grade school and so forth in Grand Junction. In Grand Junction, that's okay. right. Um, uh, when you, was there a time when you or when was the time that you thought about becoming a lawyer? Yeah, it's funny. I always wanted to be a lawyer. My uh, my father was a doctor. And so people would say in a condescending manner as they do, uh, oh, you want to be a, f a doctor like your dad? And I always said, no, I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a lawyer. And then I think I was in the ninth grade. We, they had what they call career day, where you uh, pick several careers and then you could go to a uh, classroom with the other students who were interested in that career and actually talk to somebody who was a doctor or a lawyer or a teacher explain to you the ins and outs. And so, I, of course, I signed up to see the lawyer. And uh, his advice to us was, if you want to go to law school, you should take every math class that you can. And that was a problem? It was a problem for me. Well, and, and frankly, for any lawyer, lawyers are notoriously bad at math. But this, this guy, I think he, he told us some of his experiences, and he had a a boundary dispute case where we had he had to uh, uh, you know there were two people arguing over what's the boundary between our property and he he had he knew trigonometry and so he was able to kind of guesstimate where the line was and he seemed to be very proud of that so in hindsight I think that's what that's what he was relying on you know take every math class because if you ever have a boundary dispute case uh, you'll be able to guesstimate the, the, where the boundary is. And uh, in my, I've been a lawyer for 50 years, over 50 years, and never had a boundary dispute case. So. And, and did that advice change your sort of outlook on what you it, wanted to it do? It did change my outlook because, I, well, I can't be a lawyer. I mean, here's a lawyer saying, you, you go to, if you want to go to law school, take every math class. I, I was terrible at math, so I had to find something else. So. I, I was just kind of at loose ends after that. And did, you went to high school in Grand Junction? Went to high school in Grand Junction. And uh, I was not a very stellar student. I think I graduated 312 out of a class of 396. But my parents got, had gotten divorced and, and it was kind of a time of rebellion, I think, for me. So I graduated high school in, from, in Grand Junction and uh, I realized uh, my senior year that if I were, if, if I didn't do something I was going to end up in the in the military just no other options and so uh, so I applied my father by then had moved they got divorced and he moved to West Virginia so I wrote the, all the small colleges in West Virginia and uh, got catalogs and applied to, to uh, to one in particular, the University of Charleston, and uh, thank you God, they they accepted me, and and so I went back to West Virginia, lived with my father, and went to uh, the University of Charleston for college. Uh, once I 
once I graduated, and, I, and frankly, I, I'm not bragging, but I did well, at, well in college, uh, I thought maybe I could be a professor or a, t or a teacher. And so I, after, after uh, college, I wanted to go to grad, graduate school. So I uh, was accepted at UVA in the gra in graduate school of arts and sciences. And I lasted a, a semester there. The University of Virginia. University of yep. Virginia. UVA, we, I'm sorry, UVA yeah. is what we call it. I, I, yeah, I, UVA at the University of Virginia. And uh, it, I just realized it's not for me. So what to do next? Yeah. Well, I have an uncle who owns probably the largest fleet of ships in the world. And he invited me to go on a cruise with him. That's the good news. The bad news is all his ships are painted battleship gray. <laughs> and my <laughs> uncle is your uncle, good old Uncle Sam. And the cruise he had in mind was the Vietnam War. So uh, anyway, I enlisted in the Navy. I was sent, stationed in Hawaii. Uh, and originally my, my billet was supposed to be for two years. But I met and married my wife, Eileen. When you say billet, what, what's that mean? That means my, my position, that, that position, the position I filled in Hawaii. So after you went through all the basic training and everything, you, you were stationed in Hawaii. That stationed was the first in Hawaii, place. you know, which was, which was great duty because it's everything. And of course, back then it was even better. Uh, I, my, my point is when I met my wife, yes. uh, Eileen, we got married. And uh, that extended my, my billet, if you will, for three years, which meant that I would finish my uh, Navy service in Hawaii. You would stay there for another year? Stay there for, uh, for another year. Okay. And, and slightly over a year. Judge, can I interrupt you? I'm sorry, I think the, the notes are distracting with the movement of the paper. Oh, I'm sorry. Can, can we just put them down? And if you need to refer to them, we can take a break and just resume, resume back. Just leave them, and then if you want to look down, you, I think you can. can we, yeah. Is that? Yeah, that's fine, as long as you're not moving them around. And I'm sorry, and, and you're right, I am. Yeah, so, I, so I it's, it's just a, it's a, so it's a. Just, and, and I can't even see them there, so that's perfectly fine. Okay. Let me actually readjust. And, that, and then when you see me turn the page, and you can turn the page, and just, because and, we'll be down at the bottom of, the, of that first page, okay? Yep. The, the Tennessee is what we talk. Sorry for the interruption. No, it's okay. Um, yeah, so the so question I asked, I asked was about you, 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 your, your, three, it was three year extended, billet. yes. So it was, so I got married and I was of such a rank then at that, at that point that I could, uh, that it, uh, they said, okay, well you've got to stay for another six months. Or, I'm sorry, you can, they, ex they extended me to a three year billet. Okay. Which meant I would finish my career, my Navy career, such as it was uh, in Hawaii. And so Eileen and I talked and we decided that I would go to uh, grad school at the University of Hawaii and, uh, and get an MBA. And then the, the Navy sent word down that no, now no, they changed their mind. I needed to go, I needed to vacate my position, my billet, if you will, uh, because they had people coming back from Vietnam who had a choice of duty station and many of them wanted to go to Hawaii. No big surprise. Obviously, no big surprise. It was like, I guess, going from, from hell into heaven. Yep. And so I needed to go, I had to go to, uh, to on, on board a ship for the last year of my enlistment. I, uh, I was to pick up the ship in San Francisco and then go on to uh, Vietnam. So the time came for my transfer and I got, I think I had two or three weeks of leave. So Eileen and I decided that we'd go to the mainland. I had to, I had to go to the mainland to pick up the ship, but we would go to uh, take, a, take a two or three week trip around the, the country, the mainland, uh, seeing family and friends and so on. And so that's what we did. Uh, she had friends she had a friend that she grew up with who lived in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. And her, her friend was happened to be married to a lawyer, just coincidentally. 
we uh, so we went to see them. And then we went on to see my mother in, in Grand Junction for two weeks, and then uh, and then that that was the end of it. But but the, the important part is the Las Vegas part, because her her this friend's husband was a lawyer, and after a couple of days with me. I, I said to him, you know, gee, I, I wanted to be a lawyer when I was a boy. He said, oh, Jim, I think you'd be a good lawyer. And I said, yeah, but I never took any math classes. And he said, what in the world are you talking about? <laughs> so then I related my story of a, a lawyer telling me, take all the math classes you can. He said, that's, that's baloney. You'd, you'd be a good lawyer. I think you should do it. And it just reignited my, the desire I had, kind of an innate desire to be a lawyer. Yes. So I applied to, I wrote away for catalogs from, figure, from what I thought were uh, the best 10 or 12, or not the best necessarily, but top 10 or 12 law schools. And Jim, I don't mean to interrupt you, that is, that is at that point, or is that after you? Well, after, after I, I got, so I got the, uh, got the advice from him, yes. I think you'd be a lawyer. So I went on board the ship, and then I, I took the LSAT, well, I was, I was supposed to pick up the ship in uh, San Francisco and go on to Vietnam. So while we were in Grand Junction visiting my mother, I got a telegram from the Navy and they said, no, your ship is still in Boston, still being built. Oh. So, uh, so now you have to report to Boston Naval Shipyard at your own expense. Uh, <laughs> and we'll reimburse you, don't worry, we'll reimburse you. Uh, so so that we had that change of plans. But, but anyway, I, I started writing away for catalogs and, and uh, and started filling out applications for that, my last year that I spent on board the ship, uh, writing away to, to schools that I, or I should say investigating the schools and then writing away for catalogs. But I applied to, uh, to Harvard, to Georgetown, uh, UVA, University of Virginia, Vanderbilt, uh, God, there were others, I can't think of them, but anyway, there were, there were like eight, eight schools or so that, that I applied to. So I was in that process, and my mother uh, said to me, you know, you're applying to a lot of fancy schools, and you may not get in. You've got to face facts. I said, well, that's true. She said, apply to the University of Colorado. You've got this connection to Colorado, and I know you'll get into the law school there. So I said, okay. So I included the University of Colorado in the schools that I applied to. So the first, uh, the first rejection, oh, well, wait, let me finish, I'm sorry. So anyway, I finished my, uh, my uh, enlistment on board the ship. So just, just let me interrupt you for a second. The ship you were on was what kind of ship? Because that's... It was an ammunition ship. Okay, and, you're, and you're, what did you do there? What was your job? Oh, I was what's called a yeoman, which, which is like a, it's an administrative position. You know, so it's, it's uh, uh, you know, the, the filling out... Uh, making various various reports and so on, maintaining service records and uh, for the other sailors and, and it's a kind of administrative position. Very good. I, I always thought that was cool, so I wanted to make sure that you said that. Which was fine. Anyway. So I, okay. and I was, a matter of fact, I was the leading yeoman at that point on the, on the ship. Uh, so okay. I was in charge of the ship's office. Cool. And we're so, talking about the, the, the applications you made and then... So I made, yeah, so I applied to, to the 10 or 12 law schools including Colorado. And then uh, after I got out of the Navy, I got out of the Navy in, in December of 1969, and I needed a place to live, because law, as we all know, law school starts in uh, September, so it, this is December. And uh, so Eileen and I talked, and we decided we'd move to Las Vegas and, uh, and live here for eight or nine months, and then go on to law school, and then maybe come back here. So, uh, and you thought about coming here because of the connection with her friend? With her friend. And sure. we, had, we had lived here for eight or nine months and we enjoyed it. Yep. Enjoyed the weather, enjoyed the people. And, yep. and uh, so we, uh, anyway, I applied to the schools and then the, the first rejection I got was from Harvard. And the letter said, that, Dear Mr. Mahan, I'm sorry to inform you that we will not be able to offer you a position in the class of 1973 Harvard Law School. Please understand that we have, we get applications from so many people. We only have, and I think it was 500 
positions in the class, which is a huge class. But uh, but anyway, that, the number doesn't matter. But we get uh, we get have like ten, to fifteen or twenty uh, applicants for every opening, and we can't accept every qualified candidate. But your record is so good that I'm sure you'll get in a fine law school somewhere else. And let me wish you the best of luck. It was all very positive, in other words. Right. So then uh, the next letter I got was from the University of Colorado. And it began, Dear Mr. Mahan, it seems to be fashionable for, to apply for admission to law school. But there are many people who apply who really shouldn't be applying who are not qualified to be lawyers, and you are one. <laughs> and uh, so it went on in that vein, you know, so find something else to do, you know, you have no, no place in the law. You're, uh, it was very, very negative. <laughs> so, so I made sure to send the letter on to my mother so she could see the, yeah. my success at uh, getting into the University Colorado, of Colorado. Yep. Anyway, I, I gather you didn't take their advice. I didn't. I, I decided to reject it. Yes. And, but you understand, fortunately, I had the advice from Harvard, saying, right. you know, you, you know, you've got a good record. I'm sure you're getting somewhere. I did well on the LSAT, so so that that kind of buoyed me and kept me going. Yep. And the more I looked at the the catalogs and the law schools, I liked Vanderbilt. I really kind of fell in love with Vanderbilt. And when I was accepted there, I, I, I immediately said yes, and, and, uh, and so that's where I went to law school. Excellent. Let's stop you right there. You're uh, unwittingly moving your hand. I'm going to try something here. Oh, and I, which hand is it? This one. Can you hold on to that for me? Sure. Because it's, it's uh, coming through on the microphone a little bit. In other words, just hold it so he doesn't move his hand yeah. to remind you not to move. This is a little yeah. trick we do in the media business, dude. You understand? Yes, I understand. All right, gentlemen. Okay, so we were, we were talking about um, uh, you accepted the uh, accepted admission to, to Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt. So, so we went to, went to Nashville, left Las Vegas, went to Nashville, and uh, Vandy was a great school. It was a great experience. Uh, and and then I did I did all right. Did you uh, participate did, in any well, other activities? Well, the, the main there? thing I think is I, I I was on the I was a member of the there are three members three p positions for the national moot court team. Back then there was only one national moot court. Now there's one for the First Amendment and this and that and and so on. But back then there was one national moot court competition. And it was a, called the national moot court, and uh, so I I was on the National Moot Court team for Vanderbilt for 1972, so that was a, that was a big honor. And, uh, and you enjoyed that? I enjoyed that, yeah. yeah. It was... Uh, and you graduated uh, when? From 1973. And then, and then uh, what, what did you do next? Well, let me back up, because in 1972 I, I began looking for a job. And my wife and I, Eileen and I, liked Las Vegas and wanted to come back here. And so I applied, uh, uh, my, her friend's name was, uh, she was married to a lawyer named Dale Beasy here in Las Vegas. And so I applied to that firm, the firm that, that uh, Dale was a, a member of, and also applied, I wrote to several other firms, and Lionel Sawyer, which at that time was the largest law firm in the, uh, in the state, uh, said they'd be willing to interview me. So I, I came out here Christmas vacation of 1972 and uh, showed up at Lionel Sawyer and they said, well, we've decided that we, that we aren't going to hire any law clerks this year. And so, but if you want, you can still interview with, with uh, our lawyers. And I, I said, well, yeah, because I'm, I intend to come back here and I'm, I'm going to be interacting with them for the rest of my career. So yeah, I'd like to meet them and so and get to know them. So, so that's what we did. But uh, Lionel Sawyer was just not hiring. So uh, I also interviewed with Dale Beasy's firm, and the uh, the firm was run by John Peter Lee, and John uh, took a liking to me and and uh, offered me a position. So I said, okay, I'm, I'm, I'll take it. And uh, then the, the uh, 
the, the final day I was at loose ends in, in uh, my, my flight didn't leave uh, to go back. Well, I was going on to Hawaii to meet up with Eileen then because she was back visiting her family. So I, uh, I uh, slept in a little bit. It was like 8.30 in the morning and uh, I was staying at, at the Beezy's house. And so Mrs. Beezy came running in and said, Lionel Sawyer's on the phone. So I got to go on. Well, so, so I had slept in a little bit. Yeah. So I, anyway, I got, so I got up, and then the attorney said, you know, we've uh, we've decided we're going to hire some law clerks next year. We'd <laughs> like to make you an offer. So I thought, the government it rains, it pours. But uh, so I, I didn't say I've already accepted a position. I just said, well, I've got. And I did have a, an interview set up in Hawaii. So I've got to do that, so let me do that, and, and then I'll let you know. And uh, and so I, I did go on to to Hawaii, and then wrote uh, wrote Lionel the Lionel firm a, uh, a letter from Hawaii saying I just I accepted another position. And that that position was that with was with John Peter Lee here right. in Las Vegas. Okay. And so when did you start? When did you start there? So I started there. It was I graduated in 1973. So it was just uh, that summer, in 1973. Back then, you had to uh, establish a residency uh, before you could before you could uh, take the bar. And so I had to reestablish my residency. Uh, I, I, when we left, when we went to law, when we went to law school, uh, I. Uh, I made the mistake of registering to vote in Tennessee, and uh, that destroyed my resident the residency I did have in Las Vegas. So I had to reestablish residency. So I had to clerk for a year. Is the point I'm trying to make? No, I got you. So you couldn't take the bar then until the bar was only given once a year. Then. Once a year then. It was once a year the summer. And so 1974, I took the bar, passed it, and and became a lawyer and worked at John with John at the John Peter Lee firm then for for. Uh, so I was 73 until 1982. And while you were there? Um, well, the, the cases I worked on, yeah. there were, we had a lot, John took on any, almost any case that came in the door. So we had a lot, a lot of interesting cases. Uh, probably the most interesting one was uh, when we sued Howard Hughes for uh, ownership of the Silver Slipper uh, Casino on the, uh, on the Strip. That was, that was an interesting one. And, uh, and, and interesting lawyers that you met well yeah, the, in that, in that was, case? At that time, it was funny because there were a lot of old-time lawyers still here. And, and uh, the, the one that sticks in my mind is... Sort of Louis, like we are now. Yeah, like we are now, exactly. <laughs> but the one that sticks in my mind is Louis Wiener. And Louis was, uh, was just a character, but he was a, he was a great lawyer. But he was a great human being, too, if, if you understand what yeah, I'm I saying. Do. And uh, he was funny. That you would probably be familiar with one of his his most famous client. Probably was one you'd recognize, named uh, Ben. He called him Ben. Ben Siegel. We call him Bugsy Siegel. But he was Bugsy Siegel's lawyer in Las Vegas. Wow. And of course, Bugsy was the one that that uh, built the Fl Flamingo uh, Casino Hotel Casino on the Strip, and started the started the hotels on the Strip. Right. So, but Louis was full of stories and always was a great, uh, and he was a great, great lawyer and a great uh, competitor. He never took it personally, you know, that's, it, it, uh, yep. as Shakespeare said, you know, do as members of the law, of, of the law do, strive mightily, but eat and drink as friends. And right. that was with Louis, you could eat and drink as a friend and anyway, anyway, so that was, he was yep. the, the, one of the most interesting lawyers that I met. And then what, uh, at some point, uh, your employment with, uh, with John well, Peter Lee ended? It's, it's, yeah, it, I was there, I think, nine years, including the year that I was a, a, a law clerk. And uh, I, t I wanted to go out on my own. I, I wanted to, uh, to establish my own law firm. And so, so I gave John, John Peter Lee, I gave John notice that uh, I'm planning on leaving. And he was very positive, you know, said, well, I was once in your position. I understand what you're doing, so God bless you. And, uh, 
then I went back, had to go back and t tell the other, the other associates, you know, I'm leaving, you know, and, and uh, everything's fine, but I'm leaving. And uh, so I did that, and there was a, an associate who had an office next door to mine, and I had been at the firm two years, but he was probably the, the associate I was closest to. And so I told him, I'm leaving, you know, no hard feelings, everything's fine, but I'm going to go set up my own law firm. And this young man got up, never will forget, he got up from his chair, went over and shut the, the office door, and he said, Jim, I'm on the verge of leaving too. What, what if we left together? And I said, uh, fine, you know, we get along well. We, uh, you know, we work well together. We mesh. Our, our values are the same, so I did great. So that's what we did. We would set, set up our own law firm. Who was this associate? Uh, pardon me? Who was this associate? Well, we said we'd set up our own law firm, which was everything was 50-50. And we had, an, we had an agreement, not really. <laughs> We had, in spite of the advice lawyers give their clients, we we never had a written agreement. I was we were together for 17 years. And his name was Frank Ellis, so we set up Mahan and Ellis, opened our own law office uh, in the Valley Bank building then, which is now Bank of America, I think. And um, in 1985, an opportunity came. We built our own uh, building over on, on 9th Street. And we were together for 17 years, and, uh, and, yep. and had, a, had a successful law firm here. And then you had a calling. I, I was in the, it was the uh, 19, it would have been 1997. That's right. 1997 that the, the legislature set up three additional uh, state court judgeships, district court judgeships. And I, rem I remember reading the review journal and seeing that, oh, we got three new judges, uh, three new vacancies, or three new positions, I should say, for district, district court judges. And uh, so I was reading the RJ, I read that, and then I said to my wife, you know, they've, they've set up three new judgeships. You know, it's too bad that experienced lawyers, experienced civil lawyers, and Frank and I were primarily civil lawyers, but experienced civil la lawyers never apply for these positions. I went back to reading the paper, and then that voice that we all have inside of us said, if not you, who? If not now, when? And that, that started me thinking about being a judge, which was always something, it was a position I just never, it was beyond my reach, I thought. But I, I began to consider that, and then decided to run to be a district court a district court judge. So I ran in the election of 1998, ran against Mike Cherry. Uh, we, we, I think we ran a good campaign. Uh, and I, I mean that when I say we, I mean Frank, uh, Mike, and me. I think we ran a good a good campaign. Uh, but he won, and uh, so I was at loose ends. I mean, you and I still had the, Frank and I still had the law firm. You and I yes. still had the law firm. <clears throat> but I had this bug, I'm going to be a judge. Coincidentally, Myron Levitt was a state district court judge. He was running, he ran for the Supreme Court and was elected that same election. So Department 12 was vacant and they were accepting applications to appoint uh, a judge to fill that position. So I filed an application, was interviewed by the, by a, uh, the, the committee that the, that the bar had set up, and uh, Kenny Gwynn, I was, I was a successful nominee, and, or, or successful applicant. Uh, Kenny Gwynn said, well, he called me and said, I'm going to appoint you, and, and he did. So I served in Department 12, District Court Judge. And, and, and Governor Gwynn knew you from the campaign trail. From the campaign trail, because he had been running right. for governor 
at the same time I was running for judge, so we'd see each other at events, and, and uh, he, we got to know each other very well. And it, it, he would, he would uh, the, the people told me that they'd show up at an event and he'd say, where's Jimmy? Yeah. You know, and so he kind of glom on to me. And, and if, if you've ever run for office, you know that there are people that, that come up and say, yeah, I think we should invade Mexico, you know, and, and uh, so I kind of protected him a little bit. I'd, I'd say, well, that's not something the governor of Nevada gets interested in, right. you know. And, and so I think he appreciated that. Anyway, we appreciated each other. He appointed me to, to, to uh, fill the Department 12 position. Then... Uh, you had, to, you had to run? Well, then you had to run yeah. by state law. You had to run the next election. So then I ran in 2000 and was retained. And um, it was in early 2001, I was walking across what was then the parking lot, the judge's parking lot at the state court at, at, for lunchtime one day. And, and Myron Levitt, coincidentally, who was now on the Supreme Court, I was filling his, as I told you, I was filling his position, and he, uh, uh, he was, anyway, he was walking across the, the uh, parking lot, and he said, uh, he said, Jim, how are you? I said, good, Myron, how are you? Good. And then he said, you're going to be the next federal judge. And I said, I beg your pardon? I thought I'd misheard him. And he said, they're talking about you. You're going to be the next federal judge. And, uh, He'd heard it before you did. Well, yeah, he did. He, you know, his son-in-law, I think, was was a political guru, kind of a guy, and in, involved yep. in politics. And so there was some talk, which I was unaware of. Which, but but uh, yep. they were uh, they were going to appoint me then to be the uh, the next federal judge. And did that happen? So it, it did. It did. Have, they submitted my name to the president, and uh, and so he he. Made the nomination for that for for uh, the position here in Nevada as a, as a uh, district judge. I, I can't help but remember the day that was September tenth, two thousand one, the day that he the president nominated me. Those of you who know your history know that the next day was nine eleven. So everything <laughs> kind of ground to a halt then after that, but but. Uh, we we carried on through and and did all the applications and met all the people and and uh, they were they were going to supposedly going to the, the senators the committee was going to name was submit my nomination that December so that was the December of two thousand one and. Uh, and then they got caught up in the end of end of term business. Uh, the, 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 a lot of it's a bunch of silliness, but anyway, my my nomination just sat there. And then it was uh, late January of 2000, uh, 2001, 2002? 2002. Yep, it would be 2002 that uh, uh, John Ensign, Senator Ensign, called me and said, uh, "Are you?" Are you by television? I said yes. He said, "Put on C-SPAN. In ten minutes, they're going to consider your nomination." And so uh, that's what happened. The vote was, I think, eighty-one to nothing. <laughs> so I was, uh, I was, I confirmed, and I took office. I think it was February second, two thousand two, and I've been here ever since. And your your nomination was supported by both senators. By both senators, the Republican and the Democrat. You know, so it was Harry Reid and John Ensign, but. That's what but, I recall. Uh, they, they both said very nice things about me when I went back to, to testify in front of the Senate committee. And, and it, it sailed through. I shouldn't say it sailed through. It seemed like at the time it seemed like a slog, but we slogged through anyway. Right. Well, I remember just waiting and waiting and waiting for it to happen, as I'm sure you did. Yeah, yeah. And, but, th but then it did, February 2nd, 2002. Okay. So then you were a federal Federal judge, district judge. Okay. Well, is this a good time to break, or is your card okay? Because okay. I'm going to ask you the questions. <laughs> Go ahead, Ready? Okay. So um, we talked about you being appointed. Um, one of the things that 
that I'm curious about are some of the significant cases that you've handled since you've been a judge. Are there those that kind of stand out? Uh, sure. You? And they are, understand, every, each case, and that's important for a judge to remember, each case that comes in front of me is important to the people, to the participants. So you know, what are your important cases or significant cases that, uh, well, that's significant for me or maybe significant to, to the, the community in general is different because you have to understand that every case is important to the participants. So yep. it's important that they get equal justice. So that's, that's kind of been the hallmark that I've, I've maintained with my law clerks. What's the right decision under the law? And in, in a minute, we'll talk about the gay, the gay marriage case uh, and, and what I said to him on that occasion, you know, yep. that, that, that uh, each case is important. And our, our job is the, it's, it's on, on the motto of the uh, state of Nevada Supreme Court, fiat justicia, do justice. And to, to quote Spike Lee, do the right thing. So it doesn't matter who comes in front of us, do the right thing. What's the right decision under the law? And that's what, that's what I've always operated on, that premise. And so the, the, the cases I consider significant, I, I think it would be significant to, to the community or to people in general. And so yeah, for the purpose of this. Understanding yes. that every case is significant to the participants. Right. So, so probably the most significant case would be the Hells Angels case, which I think it was in 2004, they got into a dust up with the Mongols Motorcycle Club. It was like the February 5th or so of, of that year, whatever that year was, maybe 2007. And uh, so they, anyway, they got, they got a dust up, you know, they got into a fight in the Harris Casino in Laughlin and uh, three people in, ended up dead two angels and one Mongol. And, uh, and so the, the state government filed a, filed a criminal action against the Hells Angels and a couple of Mongols. And the federal authorities filed uh, a federal case against 44 Hells Angels. And that case came to me. So getting ready for to preparing for that case the um, the marshal, the deputy marshal, deputy U.S. marshal who was assigned to the case, came to see me and, and uh, to offer some advice. And he he said, uh, "Okay, first of all, we're going to offer you portal-to-portal -portal coverage. That means you never leave the courthouse or your house except in the company of marshals. So we'll have a car meet you in the morning, pick you up, take you to court." drop you off, and then if you go out for lunch, we go out to lunch with you. When the day is over, we drive you home, and you stay home. You never leave your house except in the company of marshals. And I said, well, that sounds a little too restrictive. I'm, I'm not going to do that. And he said, okay, well, you're going to regret that because you're going to be driving to work, and uh, you'll see, oh, here's a motorcycle pulls up alongside of you on the right, and then you a little bit further, and another motorcycle pulls up on the, on the left. And this is the Hells Angels. This is what they do, trying to intimidate you. And I said, well, I don't think they're going to, they aren't going to intimidate me, and we'll, we'll, I'd rather just play it by, by, by ear rather than assuming right away that we're going to need to do that. So that was a big mistake, that I, according to him. But I said, no, no portal-to-portal -portal coverage. And so he said, okay, well, one thing you can do, you have to do is don't let them wear their colors in the courtroom because it's just a distraction. And they'll get in, they'll disrupt the court. And, and so I said, well, no, I'm not going to do that either. That's a, matter, that's a First Amendment, you know, a matter of free association or free speech, if you will. And I said, you know, if a nun wanted to wear her habit, in court, I would let her, or a Boy Scout, or a Girl Scout, uh, or somebody in the military, or the, the, the police officer. They come into court and they're wearing a uniform. 
you know, it, it, with the with a group like the Hells Angels, it, it's a matter of association. It's a free country, and and uh, free speech, free association, First Amendment issue. So I'm I'm not going to restrict that. I'm going to allow them to wear their their uh, colors in the courtroom. And of course, he said that's another, that's another big mistake that I made. I'm assuming you had no no problems with anyone. No. Following you to work on motorcycles, or yeah, no, no. So, so anyway, uh, we had the had the trial. It was funny. There were forty-four Hell's Angels. So how do you how do we have a trial with forty-four defendants? So I talked to my uh, courtroom deputy, my uh, from the clerk's office. Each each one of us has a courtroom deputy clerk, and I said, how many people can we fit? How many defendants can we fit in this courtroom? By rearranging tables and whatever, and so it looked like we could do it with 11 people. Then uh, David, who was my uh, courtroom deputy, said, "Here's a sketch it out. Here's how we could do it. A table set up here and there, and so it'd be 11, 11 Hell's Angels and their and their attorneys. And so that's what we did. Uh, we sat down for trial, and we I was going to do it in the first phase at 11, and see how that turned out, and then." The, the, and go from there, you know, and then maybe have a, have two or three waves of a turn of uh, of Hell's Angels. You know, if there were 44 of them, you could do 11. It'd be four trials, but that's that's what it would be. And then what ended up happening? It was funny. We we got into uh, got into the it was the, the completion of the second week, I think, of the trial. And the government put on its star witness, and he was a man who, coincidentally, was had been in the position that he was going to be. The following, well, I'm trying to think how to say this. He was in a position to be the president of the Hell's Angels International, and believe it or not, the Hell's Angels is an international organization, and he was going to be the president of the entire organization. And one of the one of the precepts with the Hell's Angels is you never draw a weapon, on, never pull out a weapon when you're arguing with one of the brothers. You know we don't. They may get in a fist fight, but but the weapons are a no-no. And he was one day away from the election of where he was going to be elected president, and uh, he had. Uh, he pulled a, a gun, got in a scuffle with one of the one of his brothers, and pulled a gun, and so he was immediately terminated from the from the organization. Well, now he was a star witness for the government. So he started testifying. It was a Friday. We were about two weeks into the trial. I think it was end of the second week, and and um, he had he had approached the, the government about uh, witness protection. For himself and his family, maybe six months before the trial started, it was roughly six months, and so they would fly him down to Los Angeles, where he'd meet with the prosecutors and the Department of Justice, and uh, they did not de debrief him at all. He, he testified, "We never talked about the merits of the case. We never discussed the case at all. It was all uh, witness protection, what they what they could do, and so on." And so there was evidence, uh, obviously under under Brady versus Maryland, that there's evidence of of, uh, of his trips down to Los Angeles, and and they would have a flight down, sometimes a hotel room for overnight, but the meals and then the flight back, and uh, and then he'd submit that and he'd get reimbursed for the expenses. But but he was adamant. We never talked about the merits of the case. We never discussed the case at all. It was always witness protection because I wanted to protect my family. And then uh, that actually happened the Thursday. The, the, the Friday was when they, when it all came to a head. The Friday of that week, because the the government under Brady versus Maryland had to turn over all the information they had on this witness and so they turned it over it was a little bit late but but uh, they turned over uh, vouchers and and whatnot that showed that he had that said uh, meals 
so, so much money, you know, flight down, so much money. Sale of information, $500. Well, so they had talked about the merits of the case. So that shot his yep. credibility. And uh, so it was a little bit of, there was a minor uproar, but a little bit of an uproar in the, you know, in court and, and uh, so anyway, we ended the, ended the, it happened in the late in the afternoon on the Friday and, and so, you know, that's, that's the way we left it. And then Saturday afternoon I got a phone call at home and it was a, a conference call with the lead attorneys for the government and the defendants. And uh, they said, could, I think we've settled the case. Could we meet tomorrow in your chambers? So I said, okay. So I, I called the marshals and said, you know, we're going to have them, the attorneys come in tomorrow, meet on the Hells Angels case. And we came in. I came in. They came in. We, and we sat here in this room. And on a Sunday. On a Sunday. And they did, what was the, the outcome was they, <coughs> excuse me, the outcome was that they agreed that seven of the angels would, would plead guilty. And it was the seven most culpable, that is, the, the ones who had actually used violence in the scuffle, would, would go to trial, I mean, would, would plead guilty, and uh, the case would be dismissed against the others. And that was, that was the agreement, so that's the agreement we entered into, and, uh, and that, that was not quite the end of the case, but that, that terminated the case. And, and the uh, the attorneys or the, the Hell's Angels who pleaded guilty. Of course, we had to have a hearing for each one, and where they pled guilty. You were going to have them plead guilty and then sentence them. Well, not sentence them because they, they but if they plead guilty and then they they have to go through the probation department, I got interview and, and and under the sentencing guidelines, here's our recommendation. And so so we were going through the. The uh, the process of the of the uh, uh, God I lost my train of thought. The sentencing, <laughs> the, the uh, guidelines of the of the. Well, we went to. Uh, they all pleaded guilty at once, all seven of them. Yeah, so yeah. we did that. Now go go to uh, probation and and get uh, and, and get um, interviewed for for a pre-sentence report. Right. So each one came up individually for sentencing. And the very last one that I sentenced, uh, I, I finished. I sentenced him. And I the said, seventh okay, one after you sentenced seventh, all of them. Yeah, and then and it took a, it took maybe a month to get everybody in, you know, but, but we got them all in, and I sentenced the last guy, and I said, okay, we're in recess, and the the courtroom, of course, was full of hell's angels. They always came to support their brothers, and they all stood up and started applauding. Uh, and that's the only standing ovation I got uh, in my time as a judge. But it they, was from, they were applauding from you? the Hell's Angels, and they, they were applauding me. And, you uh, know, and why? So, for giving them a fair trial. So because I I walked out, I got off the. I said thank you, and and uh, and, and uh, got off the bench. And then the the lead, the guy who had been the leader was named, named Mike Smullen. He's from Northern California. So Big Mike, they called him. So he uh, he said, "Judge, can I talk to you?" I said, "Sure." So he came up and and he said, uh, "I want to thank you for for the trial you conducted. The, you gave us a fair hearing." He said, "You know, the first day we uh, well, at the end of every day, we met in in uh, my room over at the Golden Nugget and uh, uh, discussed the day's events." And the very first day of trial, we came over there, sat down, all, all the brothers and I, and I said, guys, we're in good hands. This guy's going to be fair with us. And part of it, I, I think, may have stemmed from uh, in jury selection. I told the jury, if it, were, if it were a crime to be a member of the Hells Angels, this would be a very short trial because every one of these defendants admits he's a member of the Hells Angels. Is that right, gentlemen? And they all said yes. And, and I said, but I need jurors who are going to convict them on the evidence in this case, not on their status as members of the Hells Angels. And I, I think they appreciated that. Anyway, Big Mike said that they appreciated that. I said that, thank you for, uh, 
for the trial you conducted. You gave us a fair hearing, and, and we appreciate it. And they, they conducted themselves like, 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 uh, like angels, if you will, <laughs> in, in court. It was funny. The uh, marshal who had been to see me about, about the uh, uh, portal to portal coverage and all yeah. the coverage of what I needed to be careful of and, and on and on and on uh, came to see me on this was like maybe two years later. He came to see me on something else and, and he said, uh, or he told, told me the, the problem he was seeing me about and we talked about that. And then I, I said, oh, I saw that in the paper that there's a Hell's Angels trial going on in Washington. Did you offer the judge portal to portal coverage? And he said, "Oh, we don't do that." <laughs> well, you, and, you, they I learned said, from I, you. Gee, I wonder who educated. I didn't say this, but I no, thought, I, "Gee, I wonder who educated you about the about that." Okay, uh, that I, I, I know so that was that's, probably that's, the most of all, the, all my cases. That's probably the one that was most most uh, interesting, if you will. Right. And there was uh, in nineteen. It would have been, let's see, 2008, Obama and President, uh, turned out President, but Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton were both running for the Democrat nomination to, for President. And uh, they, the, one of them, I don't remember which, who filed the lawsuit, but, but they were unhappy with the, uh, the ru <coughs> excuse me, the rules that the uh, Democrat, uh, the local Democratic Party had, had come up with. And uh, I, one side was, one side was happy, the other side was unhappy. So it was just, it was one of those that, uh, if you like it, I don't like it. You know, that was right. kind of a thing. So, so they, they uh, somebody filed, one of them filed a lawsuit, won an injunction. And, and uh, so I, I had some, some fun with them. The, uh, one of the parties, I don't remember which one, halfway through the hearing said, you know, and, They've done such a terrible job with this, you know, and it, it's, it's so disorganized. And I said, remember what Will Rogers said. Will Rogers, the, uh, the, the famous uh, storyteller, if you will. Remember what Will Rogers said. I'm not a member of any organized, uh, any, I am not a member of any organized political party. I'm a Democrat. And of course, the, that, got the, that, lightened the, that lightened the mood, I think, and the in the uh in the courtroom so so uh anyway we we decided that that was that was just interesting uh the so that was an interesting case and and uh um um the, you also had one um i remember from the newspaper about the trump attempted assassination or the tr trump yeah there was one I'm, I'm going through it in my mind yep Chronologically, there was another one. There was a, a Catholic. He was actually a monsignor. Oh yeah, not just a priest. He was a monsignor, and uh, he developed a gambling habit, and and stole or embezzled, like I think it was like four hundred thousand dollars from the from the diocese. So he was charged with that. Uh, pleaded guilty. He came up for sentencing, and the courtroom was full. And you could, they were all his parishioners. And their, their attitude was, you know, we've forgiven him. You know, take it easy on him. We're forgiven. You could, you could just see it. But every seat was taken. It was all supporters of him. Uh, and it was quite evident they were, they were there to, to show that uh, they had forgiven him and, and I should be, go light with him. So I said to him, did you ever see the movie Lilies of the Field? Sidney Poitier builds a chapel, I think, for a group of nuns. Did you ever see that? And I, oh, yes, I did. And, and uh, the name of the movie was Lilies of the Field. And they were, the nuns were the lilies of the field. You know, Christ famously said, you know, consider the lilies of the field. You know, they're, they're arrayed in all their glory, which is greater than Solomon's glory. You were one of the lilies of the field. And you can see him almost puff up, you know, well, yes, I was. And I said, I think Shakespeare said it best, lilies that fester f smell far worse than weeds. <laughs> and you could just see, well, yeah. so I sentenced him, I think, to four years. So that was another 
another one that's, that drew Sticks some Sticks out in your mind, yep. yeah. And then, then you mentioned the Trump assassination. There are actually two Trump cases. The first one that you, you asked about was the, the assassination, attempted assassination. Right. And that, was, that happened. Trump was appearing here when he was running for president in, uh, in 2016. Yeah. Was that right? Or, 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 anyway. That's right. The first time around when he was running. And, the, uh, and uh, there was a young man that uh, there was at the convention center or whatever, and, and the young man approached a, a police officer and tried to, tried to pull his gun out of the holster so he could assassinate Trump. And of course, they t they tackled him and and all of that, and he you know, he was charged with a with a crime. I don't remember what. And so he he came up for for pretrial hearings, and that at first it was clear that he was just I, I don't know uh, uh, medically to suffer from autism or something that it, he was not quite not quite. Uh, all there, right? He was very quiet and and uh, and just couldn't answer the simplest question without some some prompting. The next time it was better. You could see that being in, being in prison and getting medication daily was making a difference in him. And then finally, when he came up for sentencing, he was coherent, just like he looked like the, anybody else off the street. And it was the transformation was just over the course of time was just amazing. And I, <coughs> when I when I sentenced him, and the, the sentencing is so important because that's looking at the individual who's who's before you. So what, and sometimes it's what what does he need, and and. Uh, and sometimes that's well, what does society need? We need to be protected from you because you're a danger. Right. Uh, but this guy was—I didn't think it was a real danger. He just needed—he needed to to be in, taking his medication, and he'd be all right. And so I, I said to him, uh, you know, there are people that suffer from medical condition, you know, and maybe have heart problems, uh, digestive problems. Uh, that, and they need some physical problem, and they need to take medication every day to to combat that, and just so they can be fit into society. And I said, you have a medical condition, and I was very careful not to say you have a mental condition or anything of that nature, right. because that's that's uh, kind of a negative to to uh, to somebody. Yep. So I said, you have a medical condition. I need you to promise me that you're going to take your medication every day, just like somebody that has uh, heart problems or, or uh, acid reflux or whatever. They have to take medication every day. So do you. You're going to pro are you going to promise me you'll do that? He said, absolutely. I see the, I see the difference in myself, and I'm going to do that. So I, I lightened his I, I've forgotten what I gave him as far as a sentence, but it, anyway, I lightened it up because of, here's a guy, he doesn't need jail. He just needs to take his medication, so I took that into account. And his mother sent me a nice, uh, a nice letter about that. Uh, you know, she appreciated the, the way I treated him. There was a, another Trump case, and this was the more recent. This was in 2020, and it was the end of September, about, and so it was about a, the election was about a month away, and uh, the President Trump filed a, a lawsuit. Uh, against the, the uh, election officials here, uh, the election was unfair and, and whatever. So, so uh, this was the end of September, and he just he just filed a lawsuit on behalf of of the voters against the election officials. So, what do we do with him? Uh, you know, we can. What, what do we do? what do we do you know what, how's, what's the best way to handle this? So I talked to my law clerks and I said, 
what I want you to do is go back to the first year of law school to cases and, and theories like real party and interest, which basically means that you can't file a lawsuit on behalf of somebody else. Now, of course, that's what lawyers do, but that's different. That, that, that I can't file a lawsuit saying I'm, I'm trying to protect Frank Ellis's rights to uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness or whatever. You have to file it. You have to bring, the lawsuit has to be brought in the name of the real party in interest. And, and he had no authority to represent the voters or pretend to represent the voters, which is what he was doing with this lawsuit. So I said, any other theories that from the first year of law school come up with it, but I'm going to dismiss this thing. And uh, one of my law clerks said, well, wait, all you have to do is let's just wait until for another month it'll be the election and then it'll all be over. And I said, well, you know, now in hindsight, is it all over? No, of course it's not. Right. But, but uh, I, I said, no, I want to cut this off at the, at, at the beginning, at the very inception. So I said, draft up a, a dis order of dismissal for me and, and go the real party and interest in all those other theories from first year law school. So they did. I signed it. And uh, and uh, we dismissed him. And uh, I understand the six or eight, maybe a number like that of other district courts around the country ad adopted our, ra uh, our reasoning and uh, dismissed similar lawsuits. Yeah, he had filed this, the same sort of claim sort of in, in other jurisdictions. In other jurisdictions yeah. in other states, Georgia and, and, uh, right. and several other states. Um, so, so we got rid of. So there was there was that, there, and I'll come back to Trump again in a minute. To talk about another case, but in the the uh, the other significant one for me before that was the gay marriage ban. Nevada had enacted a uh, a gay marriage ban that we would, Nevada would not recognize gay marriage. So it was assigned to one of the district judges who who enjoined. Who, who agreed with that position, and uh, and uh, it, it was appealed to the Ninth Circuit, and the Ninth Circuit uh, reversed it. And obviously, this was going on uh, all over the country, right. you know. And gay marriage was was a new, con somewhat new concept, but but it, it was the it was the wave of the future, if you will. So. Uh, Anyway, Ninth Circuit reversed it. It was sent back to him. He recused himself, so it got assigned to me. And uh, so I recognized, you know, we need to act on this right away because it's, uh, people are interested in this. There are people waiting to get married. And, and uh, you know, so this, uh, we don't need to stall this. We need to get rid of this right away. So I had to don't my law clerks to, uh, to once we got the, uh, got the appeal back from the Ninth Circuit, uh, prepare an appropriate order, an injunction, and joining the state of Nevada from enforcing the gay marriage ban. So we were seated, we were seated right here. Uh, there's my desk behind me. Uh, I was seated there and they were seated about where you are. And uh, I had the order in front of me, the injunction, getting ready to sign it. And I said, do you know my opinion about gay marriage? And they said, no, and I said, you never will, because my opinion doesn't matter. This is the law. This is the Constitution. This is what the law requires. And it's been, if you look on the coffee cups around the office here, they'll say, Judge Mahan, and then on the other side, it'll say, do the right thing. And so that's what I've tried to be, my hallmark. Close to 30 minutes yeah. yeah, we're almost, we're all, okay. um, uh, any other significant cases that you, or a case that you want to talk about? Well, there was, there was one that was kind of a, a curious case, uh, but I had a bank robber appearing in front of me, a career bank robber, a, an armed career bank robber. And he had, uh, he had just served he had served some period of time, I think five or six years, for bank robbery. As soon as he got released, he went out and, and <laughs> robbed more banks. And it, it, I mean, he was, he, on paper, he looked like a lost cause. 
So anyway, he came up for, for, he pleaded guilty, came up for sentencing, and he was, he was so full of life and so full of spark, and he, he had plans as to what he was going to do. That, that, that he's pleading guilty, he's going to accept the punishment, you know, but he had seen the light and, and, and frankly he had found religion in, in prison. And I remember Myron Levitt again said, I know where Jesus is, he's in the state, Nevada State Prison because that's what all the convicts tell me. <laughs> <laughs> so they found Jesus, you know. So you have to be careful as a judge because they'll say any the defendant coming before you okay, you're going to jail, oh wait, I'll say anything to avoid going to jail. And so a lot of times it's just a, a bunch of fluff. But this guy was so on fire about it. I've, I see the light, I see I'm gonna change this. I'm, I wanna come up with an organization that will help newly released pr uh, prisoners from, from prison, upon their release from prison. And, and uh, I wanna help them, that, so I wanna have a, this and, and and he had all these plans that he laid out. This is he had really thought about this. You could tell, and he was going to going to want to establish his organization that would help people like him who needed the who had needed the help. But he had found religion now, of course, and he was. A, he, but but he wanted to help the newly released prisoners and their ability and their uh, uh, efforts to to uh, lead normal lives. And it, it resonated with me. I had a had one of the OGs in front of me, one of the original gangsters. I don't remember if it was Bloods or Crips. And he was now 42 or 43 years old. And he said to me, I never will forget it. This, these are his exact words. Judge, I've wasted my life with this gang nonsense. I've wasted my life. And that's what you look for is somebody that, that sees the light and wants to be, become a productive citizen. But he said, I've wasted my life with this gang nonsense. Give me whatever sentence you're gonna give me and I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I'll serve it and then I'm gonna see what I can't do with the remainder of my life. And it was so, so poignant, but, but I, I saw kind of a reflection of that in, in John Ponder speaking to me. You know, He was just on fire what he was gonna do under the guidelines, I should have sentenced him to, I think it was 16 to 18 years or something, because he was a repeat offender. But I didn't, I, I, I think I gave him five years or six years, somewhere in that neighborhood, which was a really significant uh, variance downward. But I, I knew if I sentenced him to what the guidelines say, he would lose his enthusiasm. I mean, let's face it, after five or 10 years, you say, yeah, I'll worry about that then next year. You know, that, it's just, I needed, I needed him to stay alive, to keep that fire. And so I sent him, that's why I gave him a much lower sentence than was called for by the guidelines. So he, uh, he did get out, he served his time, got out, and uh, set up an organization called Hope for Prisoners which has been very successful. And their chapter, I can't call them, cha I don't know chapters, but they're uh, similar groups that followed his lead, the people followed his lead and set up Hope for Prisoners in, in all over the country. And he was, uh, he was pardoned by the president for, for the bank robberies in, uh, in 2020, the president he was in the White House and... and uh, that was Trump or? Trump, it was Trump and Trump pardoned him, and, but he deserved it, he deserved to be pardoned. He's, made a, he's turned his life around, made a big difference. So he's one, he's one I'm proud to be associated with, I guess. Uh, it's something he did on his own, but, but uh, I feel like I helped him on the way. Very good. So, so the, one of the reasons we're here today is because you're on senior status and you're doing these uh, oral histories. And um, you, went on senior status when or when were you eligible to do it? I was eligible to senior status you've got it's the rule of uh, that's the rule of 70 anyway when your years of service and your age equal 70 I believe the rule of 70s and so I would have been eligible in 2013 but I just continued on active status 
for another five years. This is the best job in the world. I would rather be a federal district judge than president of the United States. You can have an immediate impact on somebody's life, an immediate and direct impact on their life. And it's just that, that uh, challenge of, of uh, doing justice. Uh, like I say, the motto, the motto of the state Supreme Court, do justice. And the, the uh, I mean, it's, it's such an honor to be in this position and be able to, to, uh, to be a positive force in, in other people's lives. So, uh, and I'm sorry, I still agree. No, that's, I, that's what I was wondering. And, that's and it. So, how long are you going to keep doing it? Well, I went on, I could have gone on senior status 2013. I actually went 2018. And I hope to do it until I die. It's the best job in the world. It really, I'd rather be president, I'd rather be this than president. Well, we appreciate it, Jim, Judge Mahan. It's been an honor to to be the one asking you these questions. Well, I appreciate um, it. Thank you. So I hope I hope I did it justice. I know you did. Well, thank you. Thank you.